Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast. Each week, your host, Casey Haston, Director of Recruiting at VIP, will bring you valuable insights from thought leaders, introduce you to incredible companies, and bring you tips for landing your dream job from our team of executive recruiters at VIP. And now, Casey Haston. Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast, a podcast devoted to adding value to your career or candidate search, brought to you by VIP. I'm your host, Casey Haston, Executive Recruiter, Director of Recruiting with VIP, newly certified uh, (laughs) Executive Leadership Coach, it's kind of a mouthful to say still, and your all-around hiring guru. And today, I have a special little treat for you. So let me go ahead and get right to the introduction so we can get to the meat of this podcast. Um, So today, I'd like to welcome Alyssa Carpenter, Master's in Education and author of Cosmopolitan's Best Nonprofit Books of 2020, How to Listen and How to Be Heard, Inclusive Conversations at Work. Alyssa equips leaders with practical strategies to effectively communicate with their diverse workforces, which is why we want to talk to her today. Her work bridges communication gaps across generations, job functions, and geographies. Her goal is to provide employers with tools to not only hire diverse talent, but to also create an inclusive team that gets their work done. Whoa, how was that, Alyssa? (laughs) <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> Did you know you were all I that? I hear about yourself from someone else. <laughs> I know when I was on your podcast the other day and you were introducing me, I'm like, who is this person? You know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So thank you so much for joining us today, Alyssa. I know you and I have had some really energetic conversations, to say the least, before we got here today. But I like to start the podcast with talking about how we got connected. And I think you and I, probably not unique to everybody, but it was a a very interesting connection. So I'm going to let you tell the story. Yeah, it's so funny because it went back to LinkedIn and comments that you made on Kwame's post. And just, I I really enjoy looking at people's comments on, on posts. I think it's always intriguing. I learned so much from the posts as I do from people's comments. And I just had to reach out. Um, to get to know you and see what you're doing and how your work is. So it all really started from LinkedIn. And I think it truly, you build connections on social media, whether people realize it or not. I think a lot of it stems back to somebody taking the initiative and somebody responding to have those engagements. So, so true. And you know what? And I love that you just said that about taking that initiative and reading those comments and learning so much about somebody from those comments because the reverse can be true, right? I can learn something about you that I don't like. And if I'm a hiring manager, that may cause me not to hire you. Oh, yeah. And you see it all the time. And people are just trying to be, I'd say, quote, unquote, helpful or put things in comments that are not really helpful and things that they can really share in private or send a message to somebody. So just being aware and being mindful of what you're sharing on social media and how it might come across and what you're trying to gain or not gain or share from the information that you're providing. Well, I think that it's so perfect that a lot of our conversation is going to be around communication today (laughs) and perspectives. So that is perfect. But before we get started and dig into the meat that is you, I just want to give a real quick shout out and say, Kwame Christian, thank you for all your great content that you put out there and for bringing people like Alyssa and I together when you don't even realize you're doing it. So (laughs) he's so awesome. So you authored the book, How to Listen and How to Be Heard, Inclusive Conversations at Work. Um, And this is a guide to kind of help empower others to communicate with others, right? So why do you think so many people struggle with to feel heard in the workplace? I think some of it is even defining what being heard means. Um, Because sometimes I hear from people that you're not listening, you're not understanding my opinion. And then from other people, it's, you might be listening, but you're not taking my advice and you're not moving forward with it. So some people don't feel like they're being heard because their idea isn't the one being chosen or their thoughts or their processes aren't the ones being selected. And that's not necessarily synonymous of choosing you for X, Y, and Z and then being heard. But there's also 
just different ways that you kind of want to be heard and get your message across. And I think about just communication and thinking even specifically about emails. It's really a one-way conversation unless the other person chooses to respond. So how we communicate with one another, how we choose the way we communicate, we usually defer to our process of I like emails or I like text or phone calls or face-to-face. -face. But if we're trying to be heard and we're trying to get that message out there, we sometimes have to meet where the other person is. So I might be a text person and you might be an email. If you, if I want you to get that message and to be heard, I need to defer to how you want to receive that message. That is so good. There's so much right there <laughs> that I want to talk about because I was sitting there thinking, oh yeah, that's because I do that. That's why I do that. But one of the things that I do that I think is so helpful is with my candidates is I call it, it's my managing expectations section, right? And so many times people get disenchanted with recruiters because they tell them they're going to call them and then they never hear from them, right? And Or yeah. they'll email them 100 million times and they don't get a response. And so I set up that expectation, and I think this is exactly what you were saying in the very beginning, that I'm not going to call you to check in. So don't expect me just to call you randomly to see how you're doing. You're, you're a big boy. You're a big girl. That's your job search, right? I'm an additional resource. Um, but the other thing is that I think is so interesting is that I tell them, don't email me. You, I, if you call me and leave me a message, I promise to respond within 24 hours. If you email me, I make no promises. So I love that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's huge. Well, and it keeps people from getting hurt feelings because they email me and then I don't respond and they're like, oh, she's just a bad recruiter. No, I told you to call me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so. is that level setting and setting expectations. And I think it goes for recruiting and just business in general and how you practice is sharing it like you did and you share that information saying, don't email me, I'm not going to get back to you. I've had people say, if I don't get back to your email within 24 hours or 48 hours, I've forgotten, call me, text me, send it again. Um, even asking those questions, you know, you're starting your team, you're new, or even now, I think it's a great time to always regroup and say, what is the best way to communicate with you for everyday situations? What's the best way to communicate with you for emergencies? And you'd be surprised what people are saying. And I don't think people are purposely ignoring your form of communication, but they can just get inundated with requests. And it's better to kind of meet people where they are, especially if you want to be heard. Um, if you're just wanting to share your message to say that you shared it, that's one thing. But if you want somebody to receive it and actually respond to it, it needs to be on a platform that they're, that they're generally checking. You know, and the other thing that you said, and I don't think I'd ever heard it put that way before, is about the, the true meaning of being heard. And just because someone doesn't go forward with your ideas, which hurts my feelings, I'll tell you that, um, <laughs> doesn't mean I wasn't heard. But sometimes we oh, yeah. mistake that as not being heard. And in doing consulting and working with organizations and having focus groups and surveys and just talking with clients, really getting to that granular part of it was something that was this aha moment as I'm talking to them about this is what I found out. It's not that they're not being heard. You know, you're sending these messages but you're not saying why you didn't go with their idea or what the next step is or what happened. And they're not feeling heard. And by speaking louder and longer and using this big voice, does it mean your message is going to get heard? So to truly understand what being heard means to your employees, people you're recruiting is really, really important. Well, you know, and I just love what you just said. That we're never going to get off this first question. Um, no, I love it. <laughs> so, a way that a company could help their employees, and let's just take me as an example, you know, I just told you I get my feelings hurt if my ideas don't get implemented, right? Especially if there's no follow through. And what I just heard you say was that, do you see what I did there? What I heard you say? <laughs> um, what I heard you say was that, you know, it would be helpful if the employers would say, this is why we didn't move forward with your ideas. So then I know I was heard, it's just that that wasn't selected to move forward. And that's huge because oftentimes you're just sitting around kind of waiting or somebody asks you to do a project, never wants to follow up. And you're like, what was the point of doing this? And it's just a simple circle back. And you don't have to explain everything about why you went with another idea or everything this way. Show appreciation for people's ideas, mm -hmm. show that you're moving forward. If there's a way to put their idea on hold till later or anything like that. I think that's just, it's essential because people want to know 
that you you've heard them, right? It's like I have two little kids and I hear them nagging of I'm like, I hear you, I hear you, you know, just let them know, right? And they're gonna be sitting in the back more disengaged or just speaking louder. And that's not how to get your voice heard. Oh, that's so good. And and I, especially the part about speaking louder. That's not what you need to do or interrupting, you know, just to be heard, right? So, okay, mm -hmm. so let's move on. So you are an expert at helping companies to create inclusive environments. I know you're really big on diversity and inclusive, inclusivity. Did I say that right? You know, mm -hmm. within the workplace. Um, what does inclusiveness look like when done right? I want to, that's an awesome question. I want to take a step back and define essentially some of those terms just okay. to make it make a little bit of sense because I think we get confused on what those spaces look like. So to me, diversity is the who, it's the people. Um, you might have different races and genders, ethnicities are actually three types of diversity, which is demographic, which are those things, is experiential, so experiences and things we went through, um, affinities and hobbies. And then we also have cognitive, which is where neurodiversity, you can have autism and ADHD that all falls into it. So it's the who. So you can have a lot of people in your organization who are from different spaces, from different backgrounds. Inclusion is a practice or a what, an action. So it's bringing those people to the table and inviting them to be able to share their opinions. It's um, just creating different practices and being a mentor and being a sponsor and creating psychologically safe spaces where people feel like they can share their ideas because we can't just say that, you know, share your idea, it's safe, it's fine, but you're never sharing your ideas, you're never including people's decisions, you're never having those conversations. So there has to be a psychologically safe space. So again, inclusion is that practice and inviting people to the table and asking their opinion and having them share their ideas. And then belonging is that internal sense of I feel valued, I feel heard, I feel seen. So it's almost a product of inclusion is people who can say I belong here. That is so good. And I love that what you said about creating that psychological safe space. Um, you know, and I, you know, I can tell you this right now that we had an episode a couple of years ago um, at VIP where we had somebody leave because they weren't getting what they wanted as far as promotions, as far as increased responsibilities and stuff like that. And when they left, the, the, the management was just like, we had no idea you wanted that. We had no idea. And they created a space, they, they did it all hands on deck, and I've talked about this before, and they created a space and they're like, look, we want each of you to know that if there's something else you want to be doing, and this is before the podcast, by the way, and mm -hmm. before the coaching and all that, if there's something else you want to be doing, we want to support you the best we can, and if we can't support you here, we're going to help support you somewhere else. We will help you find that place that will get you what you want. And so they really opened up that space to allow us to come forward. Like, to come forward about a podcast, right? To come forward and say, hey, I think we need to roll coaching into this organization. And they were so open to it. And now we're moving forward with everything. But had they not created that space and told us it was okay to do that, we I would have probably never done it. Oh, yeah. And it's and even if your supervisors or managers are then showing you, okay, we're going to try this new idea. Do you want to try this thing? Or tell me more. Or help me understand. Because once they're modeling that behavior and then you're in the space or, you know, Casey, do you have an idea that you want to share? Or you really shared something with me that was awesome in the hallway here. Do you mind if I share it with the rest of the group? It's including them because it can be scary if you're sitting in a table, you don't feel like you belong or in a group of people you belong. And to just assume from day one, even if people have the knowledge or experience that they feel comfortable just sharing something or giving an idea or challenging the status quo, that's just not gonna happen. So the foundation of all of it is creating that psychologically safe space where people feel like their, their voices matter, that you're doing that, you're modeling that behavior too as a leader and your team's doing it. And once that happens, then people feel a little bit more comfortable like that individual might have been able to say earlier on that I'm looking for X, Y, and Z. And that's where uh, stay conversations come in too. So we usually have exit interviews or conversations when people leave. Um, what would have kept you here? What could we have done differently? What support do you need? But having those conversations as part of your one-on-one -on -one conversations and you know, continual engagement is how you get to know your employees and how you can provide those opportunities for them along the way. 
I love what you just called those <laughs> stay conversations. Mm -hmm. That I did not coin that myself. I, I do not remember where the phrase came from, but it was not my personal phrase. Oh, you should have totally owned that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I let, I'm going to start using that from now on. Stay conversations instead of like one-on-ones or reviews or something like that. It's huge, right? And then it shows that you care. You're interested in what they have to say. Um, when you say to somebody, what do you need from me? Or what resources or tools will make your job easier? Even now as we're you know, home and continuing and things are changing and evolving, inclusion also means meeting people where they are. So I might need a different schedule or different supplies or something from somebody else. If I'm going in a workspace and I have a wheelchair, my space might need to look different than somebody else. So there's so many different pieces of it. So allowing those conversations to happen will create more inclusion. So what are some warning signs that an employer might look for to know that they their environment may not be inclusive? I think sometimes we assume that people are going to say, we're not inclusive, we need to be better, or, I don't trust you. And those aren't things that typically happen. Um, they are almost the result of something else. And you'll see it just in everyday things in terms of people not handing in their work when, you know, when they're supposed to or being a little bit late or not sharing, you know, noticing changes of behavior of somebody who used to share, ask for more ideas and more projects and now has become, you know, more disengaged or even actively disengaged. So it'll show up in little ways each day. But even thinking about your team building, do you have people who are over in the one person or two people over in a corner and everybody else is over here. So being aware of what it physically looks like in the spaces, people's interactions with each other, and any changes of behavior that you might see for somebody who was really involved and just seems to be stepping back a little bit. You see clicks forming between different groups. That's a mm -hmm. sign that maybe they don't feel safe elsewhere. They feel safe with each other. Maybe other people don't feel safe with those people. So take note of those little things and those behaviors that are happening because especially if it's not psychologically safe, I'm not going to say to you, and I don't feel comfortable with you, Casey, I wouldn't say, I don't trust you. You know, I don't think you're inclusive. It's very rare um, that somebody would have that conversation. You know, and it's so interesting that you say that, especially about the clicks, because I can tell you probably every place I've ever worked has had those. So are you telling me every place I've ever worked is on the edge of maybe not being inclusive? And it could, could be just people who enjoy going to lunch together or people who enjoy kind of doing work together. But if you're continually having these clicks of people working on projects and you're never mm. having outside of opinions, you're never bringing in people from different departments, you're continually hiring the same people. So, you know, when you're thinking about recruiting and who you're going to bring in, you don't want the same people, the same ideas, the same experiences. Who's going to challenge a status quo? Who can help us tap into new markets? What are we missing? We have to think differently about it. But you gravitate towards just as humans, you want to be around people you, you know, like, trust, and relate to, and who are similar to you. So that's where those clicks come in. But if that those clicks are there and are getting in the way of being productive, being engaged, tapping into new markets, that's where a real problem is happening. Yeah, I can definitely see what you're saying there because I've noticed not here, but in jobs past where those clicks would form. And I mean, let's just wrap this up with communication because their communication would be all about everybody else. You know, this little click mm -hmm. and it would be like, it was just numbing, you know, to have to be around them. And it was so, and, and nothing was done about it. So, and it just continued. Yeah. And even thinking about like acronyms and terminology and things, I remember even going to the first day of a job and people are using these acronyms and terms. Like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And nobody, and I would ask and it was like, oh, okay, you'll get it eventually. You'll get it eventually. That's not being inclusive, right? If, if, you're using language and things that people don't understand. And as you're going to different meetings and as you're working together, people are still trying to figure out what you said in the first five seconds. There's no way they're following you um, throughout this whole conversation or whole meeting you're having. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I recently listened to your TEDx talk, which was 
absolutely fabulous. It really changed the whole direction that this conversation went. I was going in a different direction before, but um, but then I listened. To that, I was like, oh no, we have got to talk about this and the communication. And you mentioned there's three keys. It was your perspective on authentic communication, and I love that. Authentic. It's my favorite word in the world. But you mentioned there's three keys to authentic communication, including appreciating the other perspective. And this really hit me, this one right here. And so I was wondering if maybe you could expand a little bit on this and tell us a little bit more about what you mean by that. And I struggled with this for some time. And even the TEDx talk, I talk about just experiences I've had because sometimes we think that we have to be right or if we're right, that other person's wrong or if they're right, we're wrong. And it's not like that at all. Um, it's really understanding where the other person is coming from and listening and appreciating what they're saying for what they're saying. Um, oftentimes, even the tweak of our verbiage and things that we say, I'm sorry if you feel that way. It's not, I'm sorry if, I'm sorry that you feel that way. You are almost become really defensive in the actions because our intent can be very different from the impact. So I think it's very important to just acknowledge that it may not be your perspective, it may not be where you're coming from or how you intended things to be, but those feelings and those emotions from the other person are very real. So really just listening and understanding where they're coming from doesn't mean one person has to be right and the other is wrong. You know, I, I was just thinking of an example of this that happened today on perspective, okay? And it's how you can say something with one intent but the other person takes it a different way, which is their perspective, right? That's what we're talking about. So I was texting with my boyfriend earlier today, and I said, I'm heading to the studio in about an hour and a half. And he goes, call me, please. That's all he said, call me, please. So I thought he meant call right away. And so I call him, and he's like, what do you want? I was like, you said call me. He said, I meant when you were on your way to the studio. Okay, that's not what you said, <laughs> but do you see how, I mean, he, he intended something completely different than what I received. Oh, yeah, or even the, uh, like, when I ask you a question or I say something and then somebody texts me back, K, not even the okay, and I'm like, okay, maybe they're in a rush, you know, there's this, wait, you couldn't just say okay, you know, thinking what I said is invaluable, so it's, there's so much that gets lost between the lines, especially in nonverbal communication and written communication and in work, unless you use capital letters and emojis and all these other things, it's hard to really understand. And that's why the conversation needs to happen to even understand the other person's perspective. Because then we're making assumptions like you did, like I do, about what the other person is feeling in that moment. Yeah, and that's so true. And I'm really, really bad about using lots of exclamation points because by nature, I'm super excited about everything. And so I know, I know that's why you and I get along so well. And so I want when, like, even when I'm posting on other people's, uh, I try, I'm like, okay, you may only use two exclamation points this time. You know, if you have three sentences, two exclamation points, you can't put exclamation points on all three sentences. But then I sometimes wonder, I'm like, I mean, do people think I just don't know where the period is? You know, I mean, but I do the same thing. I limit my, I write out my email and then I go back. Like, wait a minute, I said it too many times. And I had a coworker who was the opposite, who like showed no emotion, very professional emails, and she would write them out and then she was done and go back and say, okay, I could probably use an exclamation point here. Maybe it's important if I add these words to make it more soft. It's just, it's funny because, you know, people do it from different perspectives. That is so interesting. That's so interesting. So I'm not crazy for all of you out there who look at follow me on LinkedIn. I just am truly that excited about life and whatever I'm commenting on. So you're going to get my exclamation points, plain and simple. Yeah. <laughs> so I think another thing you talked about in your TEDx talk, which I really love, was vulnerability. And I think that uh, you encouraged others to embrace their vulnerability so that they can achieve that authentic understanding in communication. So how can employers and employees practice vulnerability in the workplace? It's tricky. And then one of my favorite people to follow too is Brene Brown. I love anything and everything she does. Rumble with <laughs> vulnerability. I can't even say it now. Yeah. I'm smiling too big. <laughs> Rumble with vulnerability. And it's so tricky because sometimes we're like, be vulnerable. And if you've never shared anything about yourself before, you don't know what to do. You don't know what to say, especially if you're in your leadership role. And, and sometimes we try to compartmentalize and say, this is personal Alyssa and this is professional Alyssa. And what I think the pandemic has done is 
breaking it down a little bit, you're in people's homes, you're seeing people in a different space than they used to have. At this point, or just in general, embrace it. Um, I would be so embarrassed before if my kids would walk in, not that that's ideal situation, right? You're doing a training, I don't want my kids coming in, my dog's barking, you know, anything like that, but embrace it. Show, okay, this is, I'm struggling a little bit trying to find the balance. My kids are homeschooled. You might hear them in the background. You might hear my daughter play flute. That's not divulging your whole life's history and everything going on that was wrong in your life. Just show that you're human. Then your employees who have children who are also struggling may be able to ask you some information for advice, maybe a tweak in their schedule. It just breaks down who you are a little bit and even being vulnerable and sharing ideas and back to the psychologically kind of safe space conversation. If you're asking your employees to share ideas and provide feedback, you need to be able to do the same and you might share a crappy idea that nobody likes. That's fine. Be vulnerable, put it out there, you know, add that, share experiences where maybe you failed. Just be you. Um, people will respect that a little bit more. And I'm a the same exclamation point, like to see the positive in every situation. But you know, we have to be real and be who we are, or it's hard to relate, you know, in that space. So finding, if you're still finding it hard, finding small things that you feel comfortable sharing or small things that you feel like you can be vulnerable about. And that will get you far really with your employees. Yeah, I think that when it comes to vulnerability, um, I think it's also important, and I think this is a mind shift and a mindset that many people have a hard time with, is so when they're starting to be vulnerable, they're thinking so much about if the other person's going to like what they have to say, if they're going to like them after they say it, right? And I think it's so important that you get that out of your head. It's none of your business what other people think about you, right? Mm -hmm. So if you go into each situation not caring, I'm not saying not caring about the person, but not caring about how they feel about you, right? And I'm not saying go like slap somebody upside the face and think that's okay. But I'm just saying like in everyday life, if you quit worrying about if others like you or not, it's going to allow you to be just a little bit more vulnerable because you're not going to care. And you can't control how other people think about you or what, you know, or how they, if they trust you or not, those are just things that happen. It's hard to trust people if they're not vulnerable, if they're not sharing anything about themselves and they just, we're not robots, you know, we're humans and just sharing that just goes so far. So even thinking about the little things that are going on in your everyday life that you might want to share or like, oh man, I ran late. I didn't have any dinner ready. I don't know what I'm going to do. Or you have a stain on your shirt. I mean, like anything is small things that build up and build those relationships. Absolutely. So let's talk about the hiring process just a little bit before we run out of time. Um, how can leaders hire employees that encourage diversity and inclusion in the workplace? How do we do that? So I, yeah, I'll take it kind of from two directions. One, thinking about diversity, I don't want to say in a different way, but oftentimes from clients I hear, I want to really hire more diverse professionals, but I can't find qualified candidates. And it's really hard for people to find out that you're hiring if they don't know that you exist. So thinking about where people are of the diverse backgrounds you're looking for and getting clear on what that means. So diversity in some industries might be female employees, but that may be then you're getting all white female employees. It might be black employees or bilingual employees, getting clear on what diversity means, why you want it, what it looks like, and how that's going to contribute to your organization. And then meeting those people where they are. Is it putting an ad in a Spanish newspaper? Is it joining different LinkedIn groups? Is it going to the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce or Black, Black Chamber of Commerce events? So thinking differently about where to recruit people from. And in the interview process, when you're having those conversations, ask, use behavioral based questions, um, you know, in your current job or previous job, how have you really taken seriously DNI? What actions have you taken or brought forth to your organization? Or our organization's DNI mission is X, Y, and Z. How will you be contributing to that mission when you're here? What actions would you take or would you suggest when you're here? So flat out asking those questions and making that part of the candidate evaluation process, somebody's commitment to DNI. So if you're just looking for diverse people and not creating inclusive spaces, not asking the questions and making it a large part, you're not creating this, this system, this process 
that will help with retention and help engagement. It's just a revolving door of diverse individuals that are coming in and out because you don't have a space for them to feel comfortable and you don't have a space where people have also really ingrained in them and want to make that part of their mission as part of their job. You know, I had a client, a very, very large client, ask me one time um, what my policy was on diversity. And I was a very young recruiter at the time, and I just said, I'm going to submit the best qualified candidates. Otherwise, I'm discriminating, right? And they did not like that answer whatsoever. And I lost the client because they had a very strict diversity. They were a Fortune 500 company. They had a very strict diversity policy. And so for every X type of candidate that I submitted, I had to submit Y. I couldn't submit 2X. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so it was really interesting and I learned a very valuable lesson about how important diversity, even though, yes, I might have two X's that are completely qualified for the role, I still need to present a Y. But it's so hard and it's, and you hear it all the time of, I want, I pick the best qualified or the most qualified candidate and it stops there. And it's not that people are not qualified for the role. You don't know where to find them. They're not applying. You know, if you are looking for a woman, you have 10 applicants, you have one woman, people feel like, do I have to hire this person? They're not as qualified as all these other people. And then we get into the cycle of, well, I want to hire the best qualified person. And we're seeing now more and more companies are making that part of their policy. Like Goldman Sachs is not taking a company public unless they have one diversity board officer. NASDAQ put something out, I guess it was a couple of days ago, um, that anybody they have to have, I believe it's one female and then another diverse representative on their board. So mm. people are taking this very seriously in terms of recruiting and taking on clients. So if it's something that's really in the mission, thinking about not only how you're going to do it internally, but how are you going to breed that out to the people that you're bringing in? Or if you're thinking about recruiting, how are you going to make that a point to your clients that this is also important to us? We don't take on clients that don't take diversity seriously, who aren't looking to bring in more diverse qualified candidates. Well, I definitely learned my lesson. So, <laughs> so I'm it working. It's rock though. <laughs> yeah. There's all good intentions with what you said, right? There was yeah. all good intentions. Of, Absolutely. I want to give you the best person for the job. Absolutely. You know, and that's where we get we get stuck. Um, but I think one, it was such a learning process for you. I've definitely said and continue to say things that I am mistaken. But if we're not honest and vulnerable and trying to work towards something will never get anywhere. We're going to make mistakes. <laughs> Absolutely. Fell forward every single day, right? <laughs> yep. So another um, aspect of communication that you had mentioned in your talk was that you need to listen with intention. Another, I, you know, I keep saying, oh, that was my favorite thing, but I think everything was my favorite thing that you said. It was such a great, I, I just really want to encourage everybody to go listen to your TED talk. And what was the name of it again? Humanize your, your workplace one conversation at a time. Oh, so good. So good. So kind of break this down for us. What does it mean to listen with intention and how can we be more intentional listeners? So I love Stephen Covey's quote, the listen with intention, um, listen with the intention to understand and not respond. And I, I would be, I really, really struggle with it as we're both the same, like, I want to say something. I'm so excited. I want to jump in or, or all these things. And I think and you always know these people who you say, oh, it's in one ear and out the other, and they're not even listening, but we all do it to some capacity, right? We think, I think I know what you might say, so I think I'm going to have my answer ready, and then I might spit it out afterwards, but I've missed something, especially as an interviewer, you have to listen to the whole conversation or else you're asking questions about things that they just said. So it's really, really hard, you know, but taking that moment and it's just you and that person, put your cell phone out of the space, eye contact, really looking at them and engaging with them and just listen to understand what they're saying, not trying to think of what you're going to say next. Because sometimes things just don't require a reply, don't require a response other than a nod or a thank you for sharing. We're not always looking for feedback. And if we're not listening with the intention to understand, we're going to be sharing information or just frustrating people. So listen to everything somebody has to say, pause, take a minute. And I challenge myself sometimes, um, even during meetings, to not be the first person to respond. Or if two other people respond, then it's my time, then I can respond to something. So if you have that habit, try to find those, those places 
where you might be able to put in some systems to help you out. I, I love what you just said about people are having that whole conversation in their head because I do that and I've really had to tame that beast. Like even now, especially, you know, being a pod, you're right. I mean, there's been times when I've asked the same question twice. Thank God we have editing, you know? <laughs> so I, I totally get what you're saying. And I've really, I think going through a coaching school and learning, because you have to listen when you're in coaching, right? And they teach you the active and intuitive listening and really not always trying to be the one talking, which is totally against my nature, you know, <laughs> um, has really helped. So I think that I, I love how you describe that listen with intention. So I know you're not going to believe this, but we are almost out of time. Oh, look at us. <laughs> I know. I know. I knew it would go fast, but I do want to make sure that we ask you our VIP questions before we let you go because nobody gets out of here without those. So <laughs> don't be scared. Maybe a little. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so are you ready for our VIP questions? I'm ready. Okay. You're going to ace this. You can't get it wrong. Um, <laughs> if you were chosen to be one of the first colonists on Mars, what three things or people would you take with you? It's so I was weirdly having this conversation with my husband like a couple weeks ago because people are like getting ready to prepare for Mars and it was freaking me out to like, how could they do this and leave everybody? So I would bring my husband and two kids, as cheesy and weird as that sounds, go like thinking about these people going and leaving everything behind was making me so worried that that would happen. So that's what I would go with. <laughs> There's it's nothing so wrong with that, taking your loved ones or with you. a way to get back enough. So maybe if one of my kids had like a backpack of fuel or something, because we would have, we would have to get back. You know, it's interesting. I've actually had people refuse to go. <laughs> it kind of sounds like to me that you're refusing. <laughs> yeah, it'd be. I'd volunteer someone else if they were interested. I there you go. Somebody else's face. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, that's so interesting that you and your husband had that conversation a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, it was like an article that popped up about people that are preparing, astronauts preparing to go to Mars in a couple of years, and I just, I like, it was so fascinating amazing what they're what they're doing I just couldn't I couldn't do it I don't think well you know you can't be great at everything right you That's choose your lane right I'll give someone else that space 100% of the time there you go all right so super interested to hear your answer to this one um what do you do each morning to set your day up for success I'm really big on working out the first thing in the morning I get up get dressed right in my workout clothes and I'll get everybody else situated. And then I'm either taking a bar class or I'm hopping on my spin bike. And that to me just gets me in the zone and I'm ready to go. And it's just part of a routine. And if I take the day, sometimes I'll take the day off. I notice a difference. Like I feel off for the rest of the day. Like something was missing. Do you have a Peloton? I got a non Peloton, but I use the Peloton app. Okay. Gotcha. I'm thinking about getting one pretty soon. So Oh, it's, I, I didn't know the draw at first, but I am fascinated and you get such a good, it almost saves time. Like I was traveling to different places and thinking, okay, do I have this time? And it was one of the things that I was sacrificing that I wish I didn't was my fitness in lieu of clients or my kids or something else. So this is so great or just anything that you can do at home that you found a commitment to, I think is great to make sure that you're taking care of yourself. You're also making yourself a priority. And I could put it in our basement, but I put it in our family room. So it just stares at me and I know <laughs> <laughs> I don't use it. It's there. It's over there crying. Alyssa. Right. Pretty much. Like, what are you doing? That's awesome. That's awesome. We'll have to talk more about that offline. So my final question, if your life's work was being summarized in a news article, what would the headline be? Right now, I think it's more of like working mom just trying to survive. I think it's just like the, the moment in time um, with so much going on and trying to figure out, you know, what are the priorities and what are things that are happening? Because it's really just things have just shaken up and one thing that was important before is, is not and then something else happens. So I think for me this year has just been an evolution of prioritizing things a little bit differently, understanding what I like, understanding what needs to go, what can I do more of, what can I do less of, and that's 
I, I hope to be able to do that for people in terms of communication and inclusion and bringing people together because we often don't don't think about that of how can we streamline the processes and how can we bring people together to, to create spaces and I think that's that's all really part of just trying to figure it out <laughs> just trying to work through it. You are such a beautiful soul. I am so <laughs> glad that we had this opportunity to chat today. <laughs> so no, how do thank you so much? <laughs> how do people find you? Yes, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn under Alyssa Carpenter or my website at notokthatsokaycoach.com. I love the name of your website. <laughs> not okay, that's <laughs> okay. <you>. okay. <laughs> that's so great. It goes with like, my whole philosophy of everything's not okay and that's okay in life. And you know, we've got to make it work or, or think about ways to, to change things up. <laughs> so awesome. Alyssa, thank you so much for being on the show today. And I just have one last thing to say to you. You are a VIP. As are you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a wrap for today. Join us next week here on the We Are VIP podcast. We'd love to know how we can help you be a VIP. To find out more, log on to wearevip.com.